the Lord Jesus. He was close. Maybe even heard the heartbeat of the Son of God. And this John, he writes about the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, that in him is no sin. Oh, this is marvelous to think about these, this threefold testimony of the sinless perfection of the Lord Jesus. And you know what, friend? If he could have sinned, it would have disqualified him altogether for being the Lamb of God and for dying for other people's sin. He had to be perfect. Without blemish, without spot, as this lamb in Exodus 12 had to be. You know what you might say? Oh, well, this is just, you know, the apostles, and they had to write good about the Lord Jesus. Listen to this now. Here's Pilate. And the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, was led before Pilate. Pilate was a very able judge. He would have judged many criminals in his day. He would have been face to face with all sorts of people. And this day now he is face to face with the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God. And he is examining the Lord Jesus. And this is what he said to the crowd. Now remember this. This is a, a Roman governor. He said to the crowd, Behold, I find no fault in this man. Marvelous. If he wanted to say something against the Lord Jesus, it would have been a lie. He couldn't find any fault in him because there was none. Sinless perfection. I'm thinking of one more. Even the crowds that followed the Lord Jesus, some of them believed in him, yes. Some of them were disciples of him, yes. But many of them were such as the Old Testament prophesied, despised and rejected of men. Many of them just followed to see something great done. But really deep within, they did not believe that this was the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior, the Lamb of God. But the crowds, the people of his day, as they looked upon the Lord Jesus, they also had to say, this man hath done all things well. They couldn't find no fault in him. The Lord Jesus... The Lamb of God, without blemish, without spot. Think again of Exodus chapter 12. So they had to take this lamb, without blemish, without spot. It had to be fit to become that Passover, that Passover lamb. Set aside, 10th to the 14th day, to prove it was all right. Had to be taken. It had to be killed. Its blood had to be caught in a basin. And the blood had to be applied to the doorposts, side posts, and also the upper post of the door of the houses in which the Israelites were resting, where they were. Friend, tonight I'm thinking of the Lord Jesus again. 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 7. Christ, our Passover, Paul writes, was sacrificed for us. And really what we have there is that the Apostle Paul, he brings this story out of Exodus 12. Maybe I shouldn't call it a story. That was real. A real account out of the history of the nation of Israel. A lovely picture of that marvelous work and sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Apostle Paul, he brings this account out of Exodus 12 into the gospel context, into New Testament truth. He makes the connection. Christ is the Passover. He is the Lamb. He was sacrificed for us. Paul is looking back now to the cross. The cross then was passed. From Exodus 12, the cross was still far in the future. The Lamb of God had been, and here again is a picture, prophetically been spoken of that he would come. But now Paul is looking back. He's looking back to the cross. And he is making known unto us that marvelous and precious truth. Christ was the Passover Lamb. And he is agreeing with what Peter says. The Lamb of God without blemish and without spot. 
and with what all of the New Testament proclaims unto us, that it was the Son of God, Christ, the Lord Jesus, who is the Lamb of God. What about Him? Paul says there in 1 Corinthians 5 that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Friend, tonight, as we think of such a statement, it would bring before us how awful sin really is. Friend, tonight, for God to be just, to be the justifier of many in this world, I say many because only those who would exercise their personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, He was sacrificed for me. It's only them who experience the justification of God to be set free from judgment for punishment from sin. Only those. But for God to be just and to be the justifier of many, for God to actually be able to provide a way of salvation, a way of redemption by which you and I could be saved, sin had to be paid for. God could not be just and just overlook sin, sweep it as it were under the carpet. It could not happen. God would otherwise not be a just God. But sin must be punished. It must be paid for. And friend, tonight, the Bible makes this clear. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 20-something. 20 22 maybe. You'll look it up. It says this, without the shedding of blood is no remission. What does that mean? It means that blood has to be shed in order for God to be able to provide and to give a full pardon. That's what remission is. Full, complete forgiveness, even beyond forgiveness. If you looked up uh, uh, remission in a dictionary, it would give you something like this at least in a, 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 a biblical dictionary. It would say something like this, that it is God treating sin as if it had never happened, completely erased it from his record. That is what remission is. It's not just cover over, put under the carpet, but no, it is a dealing with sin, a paying for sin, and a complete blotting out of it that could only be accomplished with bloodshed. And maybe we'll make mention again of Romans 6 and 23 as another night spoken of. It says this, and the scriptures can't be broken. The wages of sin is death. Friend, tonight, that's what we deserve for sinning and for being sinners. It's what we are, it's what we do, both. We deserve death. We heard it last night, so ably explained and preached about by our brother, Dave Quigley, that sin deserves death. The sinner deserves death. That's the wages of sin. But friend, here's what Paul said again. To get back to the Lamb of God, the Passover, the Christ, he said in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, that Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Friend, the precious truth of the gospel message is this, that the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, that He went into death, that He who could not sin Himself, no sin, absolutely blameless, that He willingly took the punishment that you and I deserve for our sins. He took it upon Himself. And He paid for the sins of a guilty world with his precious blood, with his life laid down. So God could justly provide full forgiveness, pardon, remission for sin for those who would trust in his Son. Friend, tonight, with this account story in Exodus 12, we read about these specific instructions that were given. Friend, with it comes a choice. A choice. See those people, they could have taken the lamb, did everything with the lamb, killed it, caught the blood in a basin, but never applied it. So the blood was shed, it was there. 
But if the people said, well, maybe this is good enough, this is how far I will go, it, it didn't apply it to the doorpost. Friend, the promise that was given was this. God said, when I see the blood on the doorpost, then will I pass over you. So, friends, salvation was conditional upon carrying out the instructions in every detail that God had given through Moses and Aaron to the people. So, friend, can I ask the question tonight? You know about the Lord Jesus? You've been reading the Bible yourself, maybe for many years, Maybe you're attending some kind of religious group, something, whatever. You don't even have to tell me. You believe that the Lord Jesus went to the cross and he died for sin. But friend, can I ask this? Have you ever applied the blood to yourself? Can I say it that way? Have you ever put the blood on the doorpost, your doorpost. You say, Holger, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this, that the gospel message brings very clearly before us the personal responsibility of every individual in this world to put their confidence 100% in the person and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to apply the blood to yourself. To take this provision for yourself is no good to know about it, to know that it is there, but to never have applied it to yourself, still under judgment. Nobody else can exercise faith on your behalf. I told that my parents the other day. When a baby is sprinkled, it's not saved. A person must make a conscious decision, a choice before God. And that is accompanied by the realization that I am a hell-deserving sinner. That I am not going to heaven the way I am. That it is my sins that have brought me far away from God. And with that realization, for a person that is saved, comes that moment. And we can look back to a particular moment when we trusted that the Lord Jesus died for me. That's what we read in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. This is really the personal testimony of the Apostle Paul as he thinks of the Lord Jesus, that Lamb of God. And he says this, that the Son of God who loved me gave himself for me. Friend, I know the time's done. But you think of that firstborn, maybe a little boy, in that house, there in Egypt, he looks upon that lamb, the carcass of it, remnants of it. He looks upon the blood in the basin. He looks upon the blood that was taken from the basin applied to the door. That little fella would most certainly appreciate that that lamb died for him. That that blood had been put on the doorpost so that he could be saved. That he did not have to perish. That he did not have to die that night. That judgment would be passed for him. He would appreciate that. And friend, tonight, he would never forget all his lifetime that moment when that lamb died for him. Friend, tonight, as this meeting comes to a close, I would like to urge you tonight to think about eternity, to think about your soul. And you heard tonight, there are those that are saved, there are those that are lost, that you would think about your condition before God, that you would get located tonight where you are. And if not saved, then you're still lost. And the provision is there for you to take. The Lord Jesus died for sinners. He died for the ungodly. The question now is this. Did he die for you? I want to pray. Our Father in heaven, I want to thank